Good evening, everyone. Good evening. What a great joy to be able to be with you this evening to celebrate this Eucharist. We're so grateful to Father Palmieri and the parish and grateful to Mother Olga and the organizers of this event and tomorrow's rally as well. I'm delighted that so many of my brother priests and fellow religious seminarians and, uh, and deacons and Mayor Koch and all of you, my brothers and sisters, are able to be here today. The overturning of the Supreme Court's decision, Roe versus Wade, was such an historic moment in our lives. I, it makes me think when I was a seminarian, I was studying German in Bavaria, and every town there was a replica of the Berlin Wall, and a sign on it in German says, a wall divides the German people. And in those days, we never thought that that wall was going to come down, but it did. And having gone to every pro-life march since the beginning and, and being with Nellie Gray when she organized the first one, in those days, people who were in favor of abortion said, well, all these people are going to die out and uh, that'll be the end of the opposition. Well. Some of us are getting closer to the grave, but uh, it's very encouraging that each year there are more and more young people uh, joining the forces. And so just as the Berlin Wall fell, it fell like the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho fell when the Ark of the Covenant was carried around those walls. And for us, the Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of the Blessed Mother who accompanies us on our journey and on our struggles and has been the patroness of the pro-life movement right from the beginning. And we turn to here today to ask for her help to dismantle all of the resistance to the gospel of life. Our attitude needs to be like that of the Good Shepherd, who lovingly seeks out the lost sheep, not to punish them for straying, but to make them come home and feel part of the flock. The Church's mission is to proclaim the gospel of life with love and with a desire to heal the deep divisions in our society. People will believe our message only when they are convinced that we care about them. I think that is very important. The gospel of life must be communicated with love and care. 200 years ago, the Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen wrote a wonderful story for children called The Emperor's New Suit. And it's the story of a very proud and vain king who thought so much of new clothes that he spent all of his money on his apparel. His only ambition was to be the best dressed. One day, two swindlers arrived in the capital and they convinced the king to buy a new suit made of a magical material that was invisible. They told the king that those who could see, not see the cloth were stupid and unfit for office. The king was quite deceived and paraded through the streets of his capital to receive the ovations of his people. The crowd lined the streets and they applauded as the king passed by. They shouted compliments and congratulated the king in his magnificent clothing. But suddenly a little child shouted out, but he's not wearing anything at all. The king continued on his way. His chamberlains walked with still greater dignity as if they were carrying the train of his robe, which did not exist. The king's new clothes today are called reproduction rights, 
termination of pregnancy, choice, and many other subterfuges that disguise the reality and the br brutality that is abortion. The crowd applauds the king's new clothes. People are afraid to question. Those who do not applaud must be stupid, naive, obstinate. The voice of the church is like that child who declares before the world that the new clothes are a lie, a humbug, a deception. The church, with the candor of a child, must call out the uncomfortable truth. Abortion is wrong. Thou shall not kill. In his last sermon before he dies on Mount Nebo, Moses tells God's people, I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life, and then you and your descendants might live by loving the Lord, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. There will be life for you. Choose life. That is the message of the church, confronted by the king's new clothes. Choose life. John Paul II commented on the many declarations of human rights and the many initiatives inspired by these ideals that seem to indicate a growing moral sensitivity, more alert to acknowledge the value and dignity of every individual as a human being, without any distinction of race, nationality, religion, political opinion, or social class. Sadly, these noble proclamations are contradicted by a tragic repudiation of them in practice. This denial is still more distressing, indeed more scandalous, precisely because it is occurring in a society which makes the affirmation and protection of human rights its primary objective and boast. The Holy Father asks, how can we reconcile these repeated declarations of human rights with a continual increase in widespread justification of attacks on human life? How can we reconcile these declarations with the refusal to accept those who are weak or needy or elderly or those who have just been conceived? These attacks go directly against respect for life and they represent a direct threat to the entire culture of human rights. It jeopardizes the very meaning of democratic coexistence. Rather than societies of people living together, our cities rest, risk becoming societies of people who are rejected, marginalized, uprooted, and oppressed. When the church raises the prophetic cry, choose life, we're performing a great service to all of society. Life is sacred. Life is a mystery. Life must be protected, nurtured, and respected. The gospel of life is the centerpiece of the church's social teaching. When the value of life is compromised or diminished, all life is at risk. When we give the church, the state, the power to determine which human beings are worthy of living and which should be eliminated, what we're doing is opening a Pandora's box that unleashes every kind of injustice and violation of human dignity. Life is precious. The transmission of life, sexuality and marriage, which is the sanctuary of life, are all sacred. The churches consistent life ethic contrasts with the incoherent proclamation of human rights that fails to protect life when it is most vulnerable. Human rights without the right to life are the king's new clothes. It's a fraud. It's an exercise in self-deception. When Roe versus Wade was handed down over 40 years ago, Archibald Cox, 
the Harvard University expert in constitutional law and the Watergate prosecutor says, this decision, Roe versus Wade, fails even to consider what I suppose to be the most compelling interest of the states in prohibiting abortion, the interest in maintaining that respect for the paramount sanctity of human life, which has always been at the center of Western civilization. The church's pro-life message is a great service to all society. The culture of death flows out of the extreme individualism of our age. The church's anecdote is always solidarity and community. Pope Francis is always talking about the culture of encounter. In his stunning apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis writes, among the vulnerable for whom the church wishes to care with particular love and concern are unborn children the most defenseless and innocent among us. Pope Francis goes on to say, frequently attempts are made to ridicule the church's efforts to defend the unborn. Attempts are made to present the church's teaching as ideological, obscurantist, conservative, yet this defense of unborn life is closely linked to the defense of each and every other human right. The Holy Father laments the fact that we have done little to adequately accompany women in very difficult situations. The good news is that God never gives up on us. He never tires of loving us, never tires of giving us another chance of forgiving us and helping us. The pro-life movement needs to be the merciful face of God to women facing difficult pregnancies. Being judgmental or condemnatory are not part of the gospel of life. In pre-revolutionary Cuba, there was a Catholic radio play on this, the radio there called La Muralla. It's the story of this middle-class Catholic family, upper middle-class, husband, wife, five children, and Every Sunday, the whole family went to Mass, and they all went to communion, except the father. And it was a great source of anxiety to the wife and the children, and they were always encouraging their dad, Dad, why, go to confession, come to communion with us. And he kept putting them off. The years passed, and at the end of his life, he's dying, and they bring in the pastor, and he gives him the last rites. And afterwards, he calls his family around the deathbed to say, you know, you were also anxious for me to receive the sacraments. He said, I really wanted to receive them, but when I was a young lawyer, I falsified a will, and all of this money that we've enjoyed in this good life for so many years really should have gone to a distant cousin of ours. And I knew that if I went to confession, I was going to have to make restitution, and I just couldn't bring myself to do that. Of course, the irony is, from that moment on, it was his wife and his children who stopped going to communion because they weren't ready to give the money back either. <laughs> you know, we're very quick to judge other people if we have not walked in their moccasins. Until we find ourselves in the same situation, we really don't know how we would react. We're not here to judge others, but to love and to help and to protect life. We must never allow that a woman perceives the pro-life movement as a bunch of angry, self-righteous Pharisees with stones in their hands looking down on her and judging her. Pope Francis urges us to practice the art of accompaniment, which teaches us how to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the other, and in this case, the woman in crisis. This accompaniment must be steady and reassuring, reflecting our closeness in our compassionate gaze that heals, liberates, and encourages growth in Christian life. This is precisely what the Sisters of Life, Project Rachel, and the community of, the, of Jesus's servants in the pro-life movements 
are doing. We're so glad that I see there's a Sister of Life here tonight. Welcome, Sister. We are here because we want to save thousands of innocent children who are being executed by the very people whose mission it is to heal and protect life. The most comforting thing about the, re the repeal of Roe versus Wade is that we know that thousands of lives have been saved by that very act. But our work is far from over. The truth is that we can save babies only by saving mothers. When they experience God's loving mercy, then they will be capable of showing mercy to their children. The pro-life movement has to be about saving mothers. We need to focus on the women to try to understand what they are suffering. The work of the Pregnancy Crisis Centers has helped countless women to be able to choose life. We owe a great debt of gratitude to all the volunteers and the workers. There are millions of women in our country who have had an abortion. There are millions of men who have pushed them, encouraged them, and have driven them to the abortion clinic. Wouldn't it be wonderful if some of them could accept John Paul II's challenge to those who have chosen abortion to commit themselves to life, whether by accepting the birth of another child or by welcoming and caring for those most in need of someone to be close to them, to become promoters of a new way of looking at human life. One person who took up this challenge was Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the founder of NARAL and the pro-abortion movement in the United States. In the 1970s, Dr. Nathanson ran an abortion clinic in New York City which operated from 8 a.m. until midnight. He performed roughly 100 abortions a day. But then, having promoted abortion and convinced people of it, convincing people of its urgency, Bernard Nathanson, the tailor that produced the King's New Clothes in the United States, finally heard that child's voice pointing out the inconvenient truth his conscience could no longer allow him to fool himself into believing that it was not a human being. Dr. Bernard Nathanson became the most eloquent opponent of abortion and the abortion industry. In 1982, I invited him to come and speak to black and Hispanic leaders in the Archdiocese of Washington at Catholic University. And a few years later, Dr. Nathanson accompanied me to Honduras where he presented his film, Silent Scream, to the medical faculty on national television. And he was very instrumental in getting the laws that legalized abortion in Honduras reversed. He spent the rest of his life trying to do the same in the United States. I am sorry he did not live to see the overturning of Roe versus Wade, but I'm sure that he and Nellie Gray from eternity are rejoicing with us. God's grace turned Saul of Tar Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, into the apostle of the Gentiles. And that grace transformed Bernard Nathanson into an apostle of the gospel of life. The antidote to abortion is always community and solidarity. Community where people are willing to care for each other, especially the most vulnerable. The message of the gospel of life is, as Pope Francis tells us in Evangelii Gaudium, a message of joy. The Holy Father writes, to those who feel far from God and the church, and to all who are fearful or indifferent, I would like to say this. The Lord, with great respect and love, is also calling you to be a part of his people. The church must be a place of mercy freely given, where everyone can feel welcomed, loved, forgiven, and encouraged to live the good life of the gospel. The very heart of the gospel is life in community and engagement with others. The challenge of Pope Francis placed before our young peoples is to be evangelizers, to evangelize with beauty and with joy. The Holy Father says to communicate the moral teachings that promote growth in the gospel of life it's helpful to stress again and again 
the attractiveness and the ideal of a life of wisdom, self-fulfillment, and enrichment. And in light of that positive message, our rejection of evils which endanger that life can be better understood. Rather than experts in dire predictions, dour judges bent on ruling out every threat and deviation, we should appear as joyful messengers of challenging proposals, guardians of the goodness and beauty which shines forth in a life of fidelity to the gospel. At Lampedusa, Pope Francis cast a wreath into the sea where thousands of poor immigrants had lost their lives. He warned about the globalization of indifference. We face this in the pro-life movement. Just as with slavery in the past, many Americans are repulsed by abortion but believe that it's a necessary evil. Our task is to show them that it is not necessary but it is an evil. Where there are community and solidarity, more humane solutions present themselves when there is a difficult pregnancy. When the abortion decision of the Supreme Court was handed down, the logical response of the pro-life movement was a resolute call for adoption, not abortion. The truth is, each year there are fewer adoptions while the number of abortions is over a million. Many young Americans don't know anyone who is adopted. And if they do know someone, it's probably someone who's from China, Russia, or Guatemala, giving the impression that entrusting a child to an adoptive family is not something that good Americans do. The history of adoption is not always been a glorious one. There was a popular film in the theaters a few years ago portraying some of the worst practices of the past. In Philomena, portrayed by Dame Judy Dench, tells the story of a young girl forced to give up her baby. It's a tragic history. We need people to hear the good stories of adoptions, of courageous birth mothers and generous adoptive families that have truly provided a loving family for an adopted child. In Boston, we're trying to make that part of a pro-life curriculum for our young people. The majority of women who succumb to abortion are poor. Poverty is a dehumanizing force that leads people to feel trapped and to make this horrible choice. The gospel of life demands that we work for economic justice in our country and in our world. A society where the rich are getting ever richer and the poor are poor, abortion looms even larger. In the city of New York, half of the black babies are aborted. Planned Parenthood was founded to, eliminate the, to eliminate the poor. We can rescue unborn babies from abortion by rescuing their mothers from a life of poverty and hopelessness. Pope Francis challenges our complacency and indifference to the oppressive poverty that spawns so many abortions. Yes, the Catholic Church's consistent life ethic is a great service to society. It's our task to witness to the truth that love, compassion, and solidarity can build a just society that will be safer for the poor, the unborn, and those on the periphery. As overturning Roe versus Wade will save so many lives, but the big challenge ahead is to change hearts. Only love and prayer will be able to bring about that revolution. Thank all of you for your commitment. May Mary, the Mother of the Divine Shepherd, accompany us as the Ark of the Covenant accompany God's people and bring the light of the Gospel into our hearts and into our world. Amen. <laughs>